So let's talk about bad Apple apps, right? These are artisanal handcrafted farm to table evil applications. So this is OAuth app attacks. You, the long form description of this is OAuth consent grant application attacks, but that's like scientific nomenclature and ain't nobody got time for that. This is like custom written malware. The attacker in this case creates applications that are specifically designed for persistence or initial access uh, and attack development, right? So there is no legitimate use for these applications. So this is like they're trying to hide, you know, random characters.exe in the process list or something like that. Like the, it, this is like a custom written piece of software that's designed for particularly uh, uh, attacks and evil and that kind of thing. And no two of these are going to really be alike, right? So like the permission scopes might be similar if they are built to access somebody's inbox by calling the graph API, some of the permissions are going to look kind of same, but the names aren't going to be the same. Uh, the publisher, if, if, if that detail even exists, is not going to be the same. So all, these are very customizable. Want to see how to build one? So all you really need to do, and again, this is just like using the system as design, feature not a bug. All you have to do is register an application that you would ostensibly be developing somewhere, right? Um, but you just build this in an, in a tenant, right? There's nothing special to this, right? Um, if you already have access, you can make a like a single tenant application that is just ba based for persistence, right? Uh, so that would be how you do that. Or if you're trying to pivot this for initial access in some kind of social engineering attack, you would make it multi-tenant, right? So you'd install it in your maybe sock puppet attacker tenant and then email somebody the uh, consent link for this one, right? So this is why these apps are so powerful because you then as an attacker get to say like, what do I need to persist or collect info or steal somebody's mailbox or stage a business email compromise, financial fraud attack or something like that. And like the most common Microsoft API is definitely the graph, right? But there are lots of other resources that you can build this to access. Um, you then just go ham with the permissions, right? Like if you need access to somebody's mailbox settings, like tick that box, right? If you need access to somebody's mailbox itself, tick that box. Some of these require admin consent. Some of them require um, uh, uh, admin permissions in the tenant. But again, if you have that, this is a really good way of persistence. There are two uh, tactics that I see that are super interesting. One of them is you just set up an OAuth authentication endpoint. You can specify that while you're making the app, you punch in a URL that says, oh yeah, go ahead and send the token once it's authenticated to this URL. That URL happens to be like an attacker listener. It's just a, a URL that the attacker controls. And then a, an access token and a refresh token for those app permissions uh, gets sent to that URL, right? The more interesting one, I think, is this one, backdooring a service principle with a permission. So remember, our service principles are like little robo guys. They're little robots. They're little local instances of the application. Well, that's really just an account, right? In in the OAuth schema, um, that's an account. And you can set up that account to have a, a one factor password that you can use to authenticate yourself as that service principle. And uh, that's how you kind of set it up. So you punch in a client secret. That's in the beginning of this presentation, I pointed out the two apps that we found had client secrets attached to them, right? This is exactly what, what's going on there. Um, you punch in the client secret and you copy down this value right here. And that's like a, it's like a 30 character long random password, right? Um, but at that point, if you have the password, if it's just an account, if a service principle is just an account and you have the password to that, you can use something like the Azure command line utility to just log in as that service principle, right? You give it the password, you say the uh, the ID of the service principle, and then you're in. And you get to now play the role of that app because you have authenticated as that app. So if the app was built to call the graph to return somebody's, uh, you know, uh, get a user list or uh, get somebody's mailbox, uh, their emails or something like that, you get to just do that, right? So I grab a token here in the headers equals authorization bear equals token. That is just, I've authenticated in this one right here. I authenticated as the service principle to the graph API, I take a token, I cash in that token for any type of information, enumerate a user's inbox rules. If you want to stage an inbox rule for business email compromise, that's a good time to do so. Um, so yeah, you get the idea, right? In summary, OAuth apps used for initial access, persistence, furthering the development of attacks. Apps are customizable. They can be persistent. They're usually flying under the radar. Some of them are like Among Us, right? It's just a, it's an imposter app. It's an evil app that's been built for evil and is blending in. Um, some of them are a little bit like a crowbar, right? Like you can't just say everybody that owns a crowbar is a criminal. 
like some people need to open a bunch of boxes, right? But like, if you see somebody like at a window using a crowbar and they're wearing like a ski mask or something, like you might think twice about what that person's intentions are, right? So that's the summary right now. That's the tradecraft. That's a little bit of the approach. That's a little bit about how OAuth apps uh, interact in this ecosystem. 